And what do you do? What's your role in uh, the Binar team? You go first, you love talking about yourself. I do, I do. Hi, my name's Stuart Buckin, and I'm a PhD student here at Curtin University in the Binner Space Program. I've been here for quite a few years, since the start really, uh, focusing on writing all the software that lets our spacecraft function in orbit. I'm Fergus Downey, so I'm another PhD student at Curtin University, uh, and I've also been here since the start of uh, the Binner Space Program. Uh, my main work at the beginning was working on the electrical power system, so that's like our batteries and our voltage regulators to make sure everything runs smoothly, uh, as well as our solar panels obviously for generating power in space. Um, after that I sort of moved on to integrating all the systems together and also working on a lot of the um, documentation and uh, safety paperwork that was necessary for us to go through the ISS. So I, I'd say the first stage is to start with a brainstorming idea of like a list of different concepts that you can come up with and then I would probably rank those in terms of like feasibility, um, I guess do you like the idea and also do you think it's a good idea ethically as well as it? it could be something wacky, it could be something feasible and I think the important thing is to start that brainstorming section, figure out what would be cool to do, what you want to do, and then later figure out is this something that we can make feasible. You could start with an idea like I want to send a goldfish to space or a grow a plant in orbit or something like that. Start with a bunch of ideas. Realistically, Pick a good one from yeah, that. <laughs> most, of them, most of them aren't going to end up being uh, actually implemented because of course you can't supply the fish with the food that it requires for two years in orbit. The next step would really be to assess what is the spacecraft able to supply to me in terms of am I going to have enough power, am I going to have radiation, thermal protection and things like that and that's going to help you narrow that selection down. I wouldn't, I wouldn't kill an idea there, I would, I would more flesh out the idea and look at what you do need mm. and then try and compare that to what the spacecraft can provide because there's always adaptations about what you can do with the spacecraft to meet the payload needs. That's true. And I, I wouldn't just pick one idea from that brainstorm, you'd probably pick multiple ideas and then you'd flesh them out to that preliminary design review stage where you say, this is how much data is going to be, how it's going to use, this is how big it's going to be, and then you take all of those different ideas and see will they fit, will they work, can they get enough power, can we get the data back, is it ethical, is it worthwhile, what does it tell us, is it just fun, or is it scientific? Mm -hmm. All of that sort of stuff, I think, is really the first stage. Before you start building, before you start really fleshing out the nitty-gritty of the design, you just need that high-level overview of it, of can it work, or is it likely that it will work. Yeah. Once you've got those concepts, you want to flesh them out to a certain point of, you know, like a presentation. You want to present this idea to people, probably us, mm. um, being the, I guess, the launch, uh, I guess the... We call the science experts or the, the launch point broker. of context, the launch broker, yeah. Uh, and essentially, you would present this idea, and then we would sit down and we would we would ask you questions about your design. You've essentially chosen the idea that you want to roll forward with, or maybe even a couple of ideas. At that stage, you're going to be talking about how you intend on integrating that with our platform. You're going to be telling us how our platform is going to be supporting your thing in space. We're looking more for stuff that you've thought about that may be a little bit beyond is this idea something that's cool that I want to do. Ideally you'd want to have maybe one or two iterations of prototypes, even if it's just like breadboarding or like a, a simple PCB that you've come together with or a simple experiment that you can show us what you expect to happen and we can suggest improvements or suggest perfections to the design so that it'll work uh, as good as possible in space. The other thing I would say is um, make sure you provide some comparisons. So why have you chose to do this over some other things? So like why did you choose to do this experiment this way rather than alternate ways of maybe doing the experiment? Um, one, one example is the radiation sensor that's being flown up in our 234. So in our um, PDR we had to make sure we had a comparison between lots of different um, radiometers that we types that we were going to use and we explained why we chose this one over the other ones to really support our claim that this is the best option, this is the best idea and why we're going on that path. So that's definitely a big part of PDR is I guess it's just like uh, presenting your design and supporting it uh, and being ready to be critiqued and uh, take those crit critiques or those um, that assessment away and then uh, rework your design ready for the critical design review to follow through. And don't be discouraged if there are feedback to be given from yes. us to you. Uh, even we've been doing this for years and we've given a PDR quite recently where we had quite a bit of constructive feedback and 
at the end of the day, it's just really useful stuff for your own personal development as an engineer. You'll be looking at, at that stage, potentially creating some prototypes to do some initial testing of your platform, of your payload. And your critical design review is when you come back to us and you tell us, this is how my thing is performed. This is exactly what's going to be happening on orbit. Between your PDR and your CDR phase, you're really just trying to prototype and finesse your design so that when it comes to the critical design review, you have the exact like design that you want to take to space, right? So your exact process of building it, your exact process of flying it, how it's going to operate, how much power it's going to use, pretty much exactly uh, what sort of data it's sending back, how often we need to activate the payload, all of that sort of information needs to be really fleshed out and presented to us in full. So also in your CDR you should be looking at testing plans, so we need to know exactly how you're going to test your finished design after the CDR and how you're going to prove to us that it'll work and that we're just not sending junk to space. Um, a testing routine is definitely, definitely needed and almost like a, a step by step plan about how you want to test this and really flesh that out and explain the, the full process for that I think is important. So after you're done with all that paperwork stuff at the start, you then get to move on to the really fun bit where you're actually building the thing. It's important to note that maybe it was a little bit boring to do the PDR, the CDR type of stuff, but what that's enabled you to do is dive into the building section with a very clear goal of what's gonna happen. If you skipped all that stuff at the start, maybe you'd end up with a working product at the end, but chances are it'll be full of bugs and it probably could have been optimized in some ways. The PDR and CDR is definitely gonna help you get to that stage prior to building. Good planning is really important and that's why you go through those review processes to make sure you have the perfect plan in place so that you can build it and you can test it and you can make sure it's ready to go to space and be as successful as possible. Um, so yeah, typically after CDR I'd expect you to have one, maybe two, if there's like a major problem that's found after the CDR. Um, versions that you will have built by then uh, and that'll sort of get you ready for your flight readiness review where you'll uh, integrate it with a, either the exact satellite or a mock of the satellite and we'll do um, sort of some flight ready testing that way uh, and make sure that everything is as you say it is. There'll be at some point a meeting with us where you'll be coming to Curtin with your payload and coming into our clean lab facility that we have here where we're building our spacecraft and we'll let you slide your payload into our spacecraft and lock it into place. There's going to be quite a bit of testing that we're going to have to do after that point. Things like vibration testing, where we strap the satellite with your payload included into a big table that's going to shake it and try and simulate the effects of a rocket launch to see if things slip around and slide. Uh, we'll be doing thermal vacuum testing, where we'll put it into our vacuum chamber here at Curtin University and we'll pump it down to the atmosphere that we would probably expect to achieve in low Earth orbit and we'll also do a thermal cycling of the temperatures we expect to be in orbit. This is going to let us understand kind of the thermal properties of how your payload is operating and if it's potentially going to break or degas in those situations. Mm. Although we expect you to do some of that testing yourself even with us or before then, um, your flight readiness review or your integration into the satellite will only be occurring just after our CDR. So after you've built your payload and you've integrated it with us, we'll still have to go through all of our testing and all of our verification processes to make sure that it works uh, and to make sure that every other part of the satellite is up to the scratch that we have said it will be at, right? Because uh, if our satellite doesn't work, your payload doesn't work, so we need to make sure that we take care, as much care of that as you guys have of your payload. Um, and make sure it's delivered successfully. So um, After that, we go to our flight readiness review and we make sure everything's ready and present that um, to the launch provider and the team and make sure everyone's happy with everything. Um, before it gets sent to Japan, where actually the satellites will be integrated into the Kibo launch module there. And they load that all into a case and then that gets shipped to America. Well, at this point it's America, we don't know what launch vehicle we're going to be on just yet. Um, but Bin one was on a SpaceX rocket and that launched from Florida. So um, that Japanese uh, supply module all went to Florida and then they integrated it into the CRS-23 mission there. Uh, and it launched from Cape Canaveral in uh, August uh, 2021. So that's what happened with Bin one uh, and the process will be much the same for the satellites you guys will be on. Once it gets to the ISS, then of course it has to sit there and wait for astronaut time and be ready to go. Um, so Bin one sat there for about five weeks uh, and then eventually they load us up onto the Canada arm and we essentially get spring loaded off of the ISS from there. Deployment day is a really, really exciting time for us. After all the testing and integration is done, we actually get to see it live streamed coming out of the International Space Station. And we would love for you to be able to come and witness that with us as we count down and we give authorization to the Japanese Space Agency to release our spacecraft carrying your payload into low Earth orbit.